Okay, thank you. Well, now I've got to get the talk up first, though. Where is it? Oh, I just need you to keep going. Sorry. Thanks very much for asking me to um, come and talk to you today. Um, I'm going to give you a broad overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the seasonal patterns. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's the role of allergy and aeroallergens. I'll mention thunderstorms because it's always in the headlines. And then I'm going to talk about why should we be interested in this field at the moment. And I'm aware that people have different sort of backgrounds um, in the audience and I thought that I'd probably better start off by telling you a little bit about the thing that I'm talking about which is asthma which is a common condition in children and adults it is probably about 10% in the UK it has symptoms of wheeze, cough, breathlessness due to airway constriction it's a varying severity um, but fatality is actually relatively rare. In the UK we have about 1,500 deaths per year. Many people with asthma are allergic. That is that they have specific IgE to common allergens and these may be indoor allergens, mites or pets, or outdoor allergens which may be pollens or moulds for example. Moulds being far less frequent, Unfre less frequent to be sensitised to moulds, but it's being sensitised to moulds is associated with quite severe asthma. Now, allergy, or atopy, is in some parts of the world very, very common. In the UK, it's pretty common. 35% of the population will be allergic to something. It may be as high as 45% in countries such as Australia and New Zealand. And many people with asthma have other atopic clinical conditions, such as hay fever. And basically, exacerbations of asthma can be triggered by infections or indeed exposure to allergens to which one is sensitised. So that's kind of like a really sort of speedy um, background to the condition. And I thought actually that what I'd do is show you some quite old data because it illustrates the issue about seasonality. It's not very fancy statistics, but it just does give you that sort of basic introduction to uh, the seasonal patterns. So these are data from the United States based on mortality figures um, in the early 1980s stratified by age. And we can see that um, the pattern is increased mortality in uh, the summer, the spring and summer months in children or in younger populations, those aged 5 to 34. No such seasonal pattern in this age group, 35 to 64. And a different seasonal pattern in those who are older with increases in asthma mortality in the winter months, probably related to infection. This suggests that this might be some sort of seasonal allergen, something that's happening in spring and summer and that is um, causing asthma mortality. And of interest in this particular paper, old as it was, it brings out that critical feature, which is if you look at these young adults who show seasonal uh, variation in asthma, many of them who die, or the increase in death, is occurring in those who are dead on arrival, DOA. So... The seasonal pattern, this increase, is associated with some sudden, severe event which prevents them from getting to hospital, whereas in the winter, some of these increases are related to probably people being in hospital and having infections. And in fact, at the same time, we have similar patterns in um, uh, the UK. Here we have this summer increase, perhaps occurring a little bit later than that we saw than we saw in, in the US, and here being more marked in uh, the 5 to 14 year olds, here we have the 25 to 34 year olds. Some people have thought that maybe, in, in those days, people thought that maybe this sort of seasonal increase in asthma mortality was due to people being away on holidays, and that they were away from holidays, they had poor asthma care, they didn't take their treatment, they didn't get and proper management of their acute attack. This was um, examined by, in fact, Anna Hansel, who works here, was involved in this publication, and it's basically just making the point 
But if you look at 0 to 34 year olds, you look at this peak in asthma mortality occurring in the summer months, it's not going to be explained by the fact that the deaths are occurring in people who are on holiday because many of them are occurring in people who are actually dying in their place of residence or at their place of residence. They're not all on holiday. Really, since that, there's been a few papers looking at asthma mortality, but really the story hasn't changed very much. There hasn't been any really robust um, uh, analyses, as far as I'm aware, um, in the UK. There has been a confidential inquiry into asthma deaths run by the Royal College of Physicians. It highlighted two things. Firstly, that death certification practice, it's still difficult to um, identify asthma deaths from death certificates because when you actually take, have a group of experts who look at those death certificates, many of those cases will not be considered to be an asthma death. And in fact, by the time they'd finished their work, there were too few um, deaths. Here's the seasonal pattern that they observed in this confidential inquiry. There were too few deaths really for them to explore relationships in a more sophisticated way in the seasonal pattern. But what about admissions? Well, all of those um, work when they'd looked at mortality and, admi and, admi and admissions at the same time had observed there were slightly different patterns. There's a different story when we start to think about admissions. So here we have children. And again, this is old data based in England and Wales, 1989. And the thing to look at is really this line. So this is the admission pattern in children aged 4 to 10 years old. And the striking feature is this peak in September. Well, if we're thinking about mortality, we might be expecting to see something occurring back here. And we can also see that there's a bit of a peak off it in early Easter, and perhaps a bit of a peak after, at this time in uh, November. And they looked at the relationship of these peaks to holidays and proposed that what this was showing was increases in infections occurring when children were returning from holidays. So these were population mixing effects causing infections which caused asthma. And in fact, we know that these periods are associated with increased viral infections within communities. The peaks in the 0 to 3 year olds probably explained by these children taking the infections back to their homes. Not so obvious in the 11 to 16 year olds, possibly because they don't mix as closely as small children, but also possibly because they've developed various immunities. Other um, um, examinations of possible admissions have been done. This was done by um, uh, Peter Burney and Guy Marks, looking at hospital admissions, including into adults, looking at this seasonal pattern. Age 5 to 34 have been combined here. So here we see what we might see, consider to be that September, that school <coughs> return peak. But we also see this peak occurring during or this increasing risk as we move into the spring and the summer. No such variations observed in the 35 to 54 year olds. And in fact, if we look at the people aged above 55 at this time, those, um, there was in fact fewer uh, admissions for asthma during the summer months. Oh, I've gone back to the chair. So just to sort of recap, and I, I recognize this is, these are old data, but they do actually bring out the key points. So for asthma mortality, we have spring and summer peaks, mainly seen in the young, a group of people who are more allergic than older people. The data suggests that these are likely to be severe and sudden, and this may come also from some clinical studies, and it's not explained by being away from usual care. Asthma admissions, on the other hand, we have these September peaks in children, infections with school return. The spring and summer um, autumn peaks occur in the young adults, with winter peaks or greater admissions in the elderly, largely because the elderly are vulnerable to um, infections, and there may be an issue about diagnos diagnosis of asthma, COPD, or other respiratory diseases, which muddles the picture. But all of these um, analyses have been based on routine health service utilisation and mortality data, and without detailed clinical information on atopic status of the individuals. And so we could use, or we have used, epidemiological or ep information coming from epidemiological surveys to try and unpick this a bit, to try and work out what the role of allergy is. 
And in one of our surveys, we've got 2,500 or about 2,500 adults with asthma. And we asked them in this survey which months of the year they thought their asthma was worth. Which, which months of the year did they usually have their asthma attacks? And for each of these questions, they would, could say no or yes. So January, February, no or yes. March, April, no or yes. And if they thought they had asthma all the way through the year and didn't think there was any seasonality, they just said yes to everything. And we also did tests of atopy. <coughs> to, uh, using a skin prick test to see what they were allergic to. And this was the first um, major thing, is that all of these, asthm not all of them, a large proportion of these asthmatic patients reported that there were specific periods of the year in which they had their asthma. In, it varied a little bit between countries, but in, most co in all countries it was above 47%, was the lowest in, in Sweden. The next thing is that if we think about the risk of asthma, or the risk of having that month of being associated with asthma. It varied, this is a crude analysis, across um, these countries, but if we look at increased risks, again, it was mainly in May or June. <coughs> Obviously, there's a wide geographical variation. So what we did was really look at the seasonal patterns of their uh, morbidity against their sensitization status. And we can see for grass sensitized, we have very strong um, seasonal effects. And people who aren't sensitized to grass, less. <coughs> and what's interesting is that the, this increase occurs earlier in southern Europe than it does in northern Europe, again, because it would fit with what we know about aerobiology or pollen counts, that the pollen season is later in northern Europe. We see a similar sort of pattern for birch. If we look at individuals who are sensitized to house dust mite, which is a perennial allergen, we see no seasonality. Or cat, again, what's considered to be a perennial allergen, it doesn't vary very much with season if you actually measure cat allergen. Um, we don't see much variation, but we see variation with cladosporium and mold and ragwort. So sensitization is important. The groups of people who are vulnerable to these allergens are quite logically those who are sensitized. But of course, the problem with this work that we did here was that we had no pollen or mold counts. They weren't available for the time period, but these are increasingly available. And of course, there's a lot of work now out there looking at which pollens might be asso specifically associated more with these seasonal variations. Here we have some work from Atlanta, but I mean, I could have shown you um, other work. So these are um, birch pollen counts across the year. So this is month across here, and we can see that the birch season is early, the oak season uh, starts a bit later, and the ragweed season much later in these countries, in, uh, in this area of Atlanta. And then they looked at hospital admissions, showing that you could see an increase in hospital admissions with increasing levels of birch, oak, grasses. They used... Um, also, they looked at uh, other air pollutants, ozone, PM, NO2, and SO2. They found that these uh, associations were robust to adjustment for these um, pollutants. And interestingly, there was no ev evidence of interaction. So these pollens were not actually interacting with the level of pollutant, which doesn't fit entirely with the body of ev evidence that we have out there. We have clinical studies that suggest that if people inhale, say, NO2, that their response to allergens is enhanced. And we might imagine that we could see this in these sort of studies. They also noticed that, for example, ragweed, ambrosia, that there wasn't very much, um, there wasn't a clear dose response. And they wondered whether this was because they couldn't adjust for these, those infections that are out in the community at that time, um, uh, which we've already um, observed or hypothesized were uh, responsible for the September peaks because if you remember ambrosia peaks down here so for some of this work we have the same old problem that we have for conventional air pollution epidemiology which is we have correlated pollutants and multiple pollutants to deal with in the UK we have also um, uh, in this study they didn't look at molds Molds are not counted so often or so frequently as pollens by any in, within any nation.
But we do know that fungal spore counts do vary very much. Here's just the variation that we see in the UK for two years, 2011 and 2012. In that confidential inquiry that I just showed you from the UK, they tried to relate these levels to uh, deaths, but they couldn't. They really didn't have enough power to do it. But there have been um, attempts to examine this within the UK, where they, um, Richard Atkinson, who's part of the MRC Centre for Environment and Health, looked at associations between childhood admissions in in England and total spore counts, and particularly, um, um, and noted some weak associations with childhood admissions that were more clearly seen for alternaria than for other moulds. And in Canada, again, they've shown that in fact the moulds may be more important or have a stronger effect than weeds, trees and grasses. So this was um, done by Dales et al, looking at um, increases in emergency um, admissions uh, with asthma where he had very detailed information on fungi and on pollen counts and indeed controlling for all of the pollutants that were available, the, um, you know, PM, NO2. There are some cor important correlations between some of these factors and it may be difficult to um, fully adjust one for the other. But certainly this work would suggest that fungi may have a stronger effect than grass. And that actually would fit with what an immunologist might say or a clinician because most people say that, po well, we know pollens are too big to be inhaled and enter the lung, whereas moulds are small particles that can get into the lung and elicit an allergic response. However, grass pollen or pollens rupture if exposed to rain, and you can see that, or exposed to water, any water. And you can see that in a very nice study that was, early, that was done in the UK by Sarah Lewis, in which she looked at the effect or the association of grass pollen count with admissions for asthma in the UK, and showed that the effect was different on whether there was a thunderstorm on that day, rain on that day, and heavy rain. But you'll notice that this is not a complete um, dose response, because there's not such a clear relationship on a heavy rain day, and that may be because standard heavy rain washes out the pollen from the air. However, the one that people know about a lot and which the public worry about more is thunderstorm aspirin. We know that back in November in uh, Melbourne there was a dramatic event. Here it says uh, kills four, but in fact eight people died. There are 8,500 additional attendances within that period for asthma at local hospitals. And thunderstorm asthma is thought, now I'm not a meteorologist and maybe somebody in this room is, so forgive me if I murder um, how thunderstorms work, but the issue is that you can have very high concentrations of pollen, or indeed it could be spores, in the um, air as a thunderstorm develops. It's sucked up, it's made wet, pollen will rupture and release the allergen that is inside. It's pushed down to ground level. And in thunderstorms that have this outflow, i.e. this idea that you have this front of air that comes out um, here, you would expect this geographical region, um, at the front of the thunderstorm, to have very high levels of um, allergen. <coughs> The critical feature about thunderstorm asthma is that it gives these huge short-lived increases in attendances. When we had one in the UK in 1994, attendances at A&E increased by 15-fold in some departments. Uh, you know, the uh, emergency, the casualty departments were running out of drugs to treat a standard um, asthma attack. The people who come in tend to be younger, probably because they're more atopic. As a group, we know that's true. But what is really interesting is that the people who come in it, some of them have never had asthma before. There are a group of people who have hay fever, they may have had hay fever, but who are sensitised. The idea being that if you can give people, or pe people can be exposed to enough allergen, even though they don't have asthma, they may exhibit asthma if we just, uh, they just have very high levels. And they're unlikely to be taking inhaled steroids. We can't predict the thunderstorms that cause asthma epidemics such as this. 
So why is this interesting now? And where's it going? I've showed you a lot of historical sort of data just to sort of give you a feel for what the picture is, but where's it going now? So the first thing that's happening really is that we've got some major changes potenti potentially in the measurement of aeroallergens. They're going to be they, where it may be improved or certainly conventional methods are being challenged. The argument being that in the past with pollen, we have relied on pollen counts and in fact the mould spore counts. But in fact the biologically active component is the allergen which is in them. And some people have, um, scientists have started to develop methods where you can measure the amount of allergen, the biologically active part in the air. <coughs> and here's some data from Worcester. The solid bars are the pollen counts. The purple lines are the biological activity and showing that there's quite a mismatch. We also know that there's different pollens at different times of the year under different circumstances will produce different amounts of allergen. So the idea is that we may be missing um, effects, effects may be bigger than we've um, noticed before. We're also in a world where air pollution, standard air pollution is increasing and changing. We know that NO2, ozone may enhance the allergic response and we question whether some of the observed associations that are reported with standard pollutants are actually confounded by allergen load and that we may be missing or getting the wrong signals. And we live in a world where we look forward to uh, climate change where we anticipate the amount of pollen or mould, the amount of allergen per pollen or per spore may alter. There have been preliminary studies suggesting things like ragweed or alternaria so ragweed may produce more allergen with increasing CO2. Alternaria may do also. We think temperature, rain, humidity may alter the mould levels on vegetation. And we think that temperature um, may alter the length, intensity and potency of pollen and mould. The vegetation may change. And so, for example, we're starting to see pictures such as this, where we know where people are modelling the effects of climate change on ragweed. Now, ragweed in the US is a potent um, uh, stimulator of allergic responses. Here we have what we can think as of annual average ragweed levels currently in Europe, and this is what they could be in a worst-case scenario, extending further into the Iberian Peninsula and with generally higher levels, particularly in Eastern Europe. And this is all set against a background where we know that there is like everything that we know so far about epidemiology of asthma and, and allergy is that um, there are likely to be increases in disease in the developing nations and that there will be a period where there's poor provision of effective and safe asthma therapies. So we have an increasing number of people who are sensitized and poorly treated who therefore will be vulnerable to um, any changes in aeroallergen. We are also aware that there are new and effective and safe immunotherapies for grass allergy, which is increasingly available. So we have a clinical um, setting. Um, uh, we have an increasingly vulnerable population, and we have um, improved methods for treating the basic um, problem of allergy. It's a complex issue. Any research in this field requires um, multidisciplinary teams in many different fields. There are some collaborations in Europe already that use all these skills to address the problem. And I suppose that's where we're at. Thanks. <laughs>